Let's revise the nuclear physics, starting with the very famous equation that delta E is equal to delta MC squared. This tells us if the mass changes by amount delta M, there will be a corresponding energy that's been either released or absorbed, which is delta E. Notice that there's a factor of C squared over here, meaning that we're actually going to get a huge amount of energy for every kilogram that has been converted. Let's apply E is equal to MC squared to a simple beta decay equation. We have carbon 14, which will decay into nitrogen 14 via beta minus decay, meaning that we're going to have a beta minus particle, which is an electron, and then an anti neutrino. Let's compare the masses before and after this nuclear reaction. We can see that the mass, the mass of the carbon before is this number here times 10 to the power minus 26, and all the corresponding masses are given here. Let's figure out our change in mass. So delta M, let's say that this will be equal to M final, take away M initial, like that. Now our final mass will just be the mass on the right hand side over here. So the mass of nitrogen 14 is just equal to 2.325.2723 and then we also have an electron so that's going to be plus 0 0.0000 0 0 Nine one one, and from that we're going to need to take away the mass of the carbon fourteen particle, which is pretty similar. So minus two point three two five three nine one four. And just remember that all of these answer or all of these numbers are multiplied by ten to the power of minus. 26. Now if we put this into a calculator, we're going to actually get a negative answer, which is minus 2.8 times 10 to the power of minus 31 kilograms. So that's a very, very small amount of mass that we have actually lost. So this amount of mass will correspond to an amount of energy that in this case has been released delta E. We can calculate that energy. We can just take the absolute value in this case of the mass because this is about the change of the mass. So all we need to do is just take this number 2.8 times 10 to the power of minus 31 and then multiply by C squared which is equal to 3.0 times 10 to the 8 squared and what we're going to find is that we get around 2.52 times 10 to the power of minus 14 joules. And this may seem like a tiny number, but this is the amount of energy that's been released from a single reaction, which is actually very large. On to electron positron annihilation. We have a couple of those over here, and uh, they annihilate and they produce two gamma ray photons to conserve momentum. What we need to do is to determine the frequency of one of those photons. So we're just going to use the fact that delta E is equal to delta MC squared, meaning that delta E will be equal to delta M. Now my total change in mass is uh, going to be twice the electron mass, because remember the electron and the positron have the same mass but opposite charge and they're fully converted to energy. Therefore delta M will be equal to 2 times 9 Point one one times 10 to the power of minus 31. And then I'm going to multiply by a factor of C squared, which is 3.0 times 10 to the 8. Don't forget the square. Now, because I'm looking for the energy of just one of those photons, and there's two of them, I'm also going to just divide this whole expression by 2, meaning that this will essentially cancel out. So delta E will then be equal to approximately 8.2 times 10 to the power of minus 14 
joules. So this is the energy that's been given to one of these photons. So this one here will get 8.2 times 10 to the power of minus 14. And this one here will also get 8.2 times 10 to the power of minus 14. Because we're looking for the frequency then all I'm going to do is just use that E is equal to HF, meaning that the frequency will be the energy divided by Planck's constant. So it's going to be 8.2 times 10 to the power of minus 14. I'm going to divide that by 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34, which is just going to give us around 1.24 times 10 to the power of 20 hertz. Remember, if we were looking for the wavelength, we will just use instead the good old equation that E is equal to HC over lambda. On to some very, very important definitions. We're going to start off with binding energy. So binding energy is the energy required to completely separate the nucleus into its constituents, which are protons and neutrons. You can think of binding energy as the energy required to separate the nucleus. For instance, you may have some protons and some neutrons. They're quite happy together, but they will require some energy to be inputted. Similarly, you can kind of think of it almost as if you had, let's say, some sort of a particle which is in a hole or in some sort of an um, energy well, it will require some energy to escape this. So this is an analogy to try and visualize binding energy. Now, mass defect is the difference between the mass of a completely separated nucleus and the nucleus itself. Typically, in our E is equal to mc squared equation, this will serve as our delta m. Very often, the questions will actually ask us to calculate the binding energy per nucleon, which is essentially just the minimum energy required to remove a nucleon from the nucleus. To calculate the binding energy, we're going to use E is equal to delta m c squared, where delta m is the mass defect and E is the binding energy. And to find the binding energy per nucleon, what we're going to do is we're going to take E is equal to mc squared, or let's put in some deltas, delta E is equal to delta mc squared, where once again, delta m is the mass defect, delta E is just the binding energy, binding energy, and then to get the binding energy per nucleon, all we need to do is divide it by n, where n is the number of nucleons. So number of nucleons. So this quantity here that I've highlighted is the binding energy per nucleon. So on to nuclear fusion and fission. So fusion occurs when two lighter nuclei combine to produce one heavy nucleus. So here's one nucleus, here's another one. Typically you need some very extreme conditions in order to overcome the Coulomb electrostatic repulsion because they're both positive. And once they're combined, they can produce a larger, heavier nucleus. Nuclear fission, on the other hand, occurs when a heavy nucleus is split into two smaller nuclei or two lighter nuclei. A graph that we need to remember for the exam is uh, given right over here. This is really, really important. This is the binding energy per nucleon with respect to the nucleon number A. Notice a couple of highlights. First of all, the most stable element is iron, which is element 56 over here. Right around this region, actually of isotopes, this is a pretty stable region over here. Elements to the right cannot yield energy through fusion as the binding energy per nucleon will decrease. 
What does that mean? This means that all of the elements on this side right here will yield energy only through fission rather than through fusion. On the other hand, elements to the left, it's, let's use a different color. So elements to the left, which are all of those elements over here, cannot yield energy through fission as the binding energy per nucleon will decrease. Ultimately, though, fusion can release a lot more energy as the binding energy difference for light and nuclei is far greater. In other words, this graph changes here considerably more. It requires, though, on the other hand, some pretty extreme conditions for fusion to occur, including high temperature and pressure to overcome that Coulomb repulsion. So just to make it absolutely clear, with induced nuclear fission, the total binding energy will be greater because we can have an element over here which might decay into an element over here, meaning that the binding energy has increased. With fusion, we also have an increase in binding energy because we may have an element here that is fused with an element here, giving us a heavier element with a higher binding energy. So in each of those cases, the binding energy, let's call it delta E, let's pick a different color, the binding energy will be increase. And we can calculate that binding energy using delta E is equal to delta mc squared. Binding energy per nucleon example. Calculate the binding energy per nucleon of beryllium 8,4. We're given the mass of the nucleus is 1.329 times 10 to the power minus 26 kilograms. The proton has a certain mass and the neutron has the mass given as well. Okay, well, first off, we need to figure out the mass defect. Our mass defect delta m is equal to the mass of the all of the separated uh, nuclei. So let's say m2 take away m1, which is just the mass of the nucleus. So in a way, initially we have a whole bunch of particles together. So this here is our before and our after is a whole bunch of particles which are fully separated quite far from one another. Okay, well, our mass of the fully separated particles will just be equal to 4 times the mass of a proton plus 4 times the mass of a neutron. How do I know this? Well, if we look over here, we're given that it's beryllium 4, uh, beryllium 8, 4, meaning that we have 4 protons and 8 nucleons altogether, meaning that we're going to have 4 neutrons as well. So in order to calculate these, all I need to do is get 4 times the mass of a proton, which is 1.673 uh, times 10 to the power of minus 27, add 4 times the mass of a neutron, which is 4.0 times 1.675 times 10 to the power of minus 27. And from that, what we need to do is take away our original mass, which is the mass of the nucleus beforehand, which is just this mass over here, 1.329 times 10 to the power of minus 26. This will, of course, give me approximately 1.020 times 10 to the power of minus 28 kilograms, and this is my mass defect. Our next step is to figure out our binding energy, and uh, this will just be equal to delta m c squared, so this is going to be 1.020 times 10 to the power of minus 28, multiplied by a factor of c squared, which is 3.0 times 10 to the 
power of 8 squared, which is going to give us approximately 9.18 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 12 joules. Because in this question, we're actually looking for the binding energy per nucleon, as it's being asked of here, what we need to do is divide by the nucleon number. The nucleon number in this case is just 8. There are 4 protons and 4 neutrons, giving us a total of 8 nucleons. So what I'm going to do is just divide my answer for the binding energy by the number of nucleons. So I'm going to find that E over 8 is equal to just 9.18 times 10 to the power of minus 12 divided by 8. Let's put this into a calculator. And we're going to get approximately 1.148 times 10 to the power of minus 12 joules per nucleon. Now let's talk about induced nuclear fission chain reaction. We have a single thermal neutron, which is actually often moving quite slowly, is absorbed by a nucleus and thus creating a heavier unstable nucleus, which undergoes fission and it splits into two nuclei and thus more neutrons. The process will then repeat itself, so this neutron will be absorbed by this uranium nucleus, which will then split into two and so on and so forth, creating a chain reaction. Now let's revise the components of a nuclear reactor. First off, we have the fuel rods and they contain uranium fuel. It's very important when we're answering questions in an exam to quote that we are talking about uranium fuel. You will not get the marks if you just say that they contain the fuel. Next up, we have the control rods. They absorb some of the neutrons to control the rate of the nuclear reaction. Now, what do I mean by that? They're actually inserted in a way such that one neutron from a previous reaction, on average, causes further fission. This makes sure that the power output is constant. So, should we just add in the word power? Uh, that I'm saying that we mean that we're talking about the power output. We also have the moderator, which is really important. It slows down the fast-moving neutrons to create thermal neutrons. And on average, they actually create the biggest probability of nuclear fission this way. But all we need to write in exam is that it slows down the fast-moving neutrons to create thermal neutrons. Water is actually one example of a moderator which works extremely well and it is found to be used as a moderator in most nuclear reactors. Finally, let's talk about nuclear fusion and temperature. You need some extreme conditions to achieve nuclear fusion, for instance, the condition inside the core of a star. You need some very high temperature and additionally, you need some very high pressure in order to overcome the electrostatic repulsion between the nuclei. Remember, the nuclei are positive, so for instance, if we have a few nuclei which are trying to fuse, they're going to be experiencing some extreme electrostatic repulsion forces because they're both positive and two charges of the same charge repel. At higher temperature, there's actually a higher probability of nuclear fusion. And this has come up a couple of times in an exam question. For instance, here's a question from OCR from 2014. So we have a figure which shows the probability of fusion with temperature T between deuterium and tritium and de deuterium and helium. Now tritium is just a form of hydrogen, an isotope of hydrogen with one proton and two neutrons. Deuterium and 
Helium, on the other hand, seems to have a lower probability. Suggest why the probability of reaction at a given temperature is smaller for deuterium and helium. Well, helium has more protons and hence a greater charge. Remember, tritium is just hydrogen, so it only has one proton, whereas helium is well, element number two, so it's going to have two protons, so it's going to be a lot more electrostatic repulsion that needs to be overcome. Therefore, the, well, the electrostatic repulsion force between the deuterium and the helium is greater, and we have scored full marks. Well done, guys. Now that you've revised this, your next step is to have a look at part one, which is all about the nuclear atom and the strong nuclear force and beta plus and beta minus decay. And have a look at this revision video over here to help you guys revise. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.